Okay, let's do this. Hello, everybody. Welcome to class today. My name is Curry Sotner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I'm so excited to have you all in class today. Today, we're going to do a deep dive on the First Amendment, speech, and press. And to walk us through this amazing zigzag of American history is our Chief Content Officer, Tom Donnelly. Tom, how excited are you for class today? And tell us kind of like the big hopes and dreams you have for this class. Thank you, Curry. Great to see everyone. I am very excited for this class. I hope that we can really give everyone a sense of sort of why the First Amendment, free speech and free press protections are so important, both in the big level of ideas, but also down on the ground, how it's affected American history. Ooh, I love that. And I love that we're going to dig into like the modern conversations in this class today at two. One thing, though, that I wanted to point out for all of our students is, you know, this is the kickoff of African American History Month as well. And we chose the topic of the First Amendment importantly for this month because it's such a great way to talk about the First Amendment and how African Americans have fought over time utilizing some of the rights in that First Amendment to make progress for us all. So Tom, can you kind of help us all understand the key pieces of how people have done that over time? Absolutely. I mean, free speech and free press, it's been one of the agents of change in America. And so we've seen just generations and generations of speakers pushing for the Declaration of Independence's promise of freedom and equality. And so in the African-American community, it's as early as 1777 with Prince Hall, a free African-American petitioning the Massachusetts legislature saying, get rid of slavery. It violates the principles of the Declaration of Independence into the 1800s with important abolitionist voices pushing for the end of slavery to key voices at the end of the 1800s after the Civil War during Reconstruction saying we got rid of slavery. Now let's make sure that African-Americans are genuinely free and equal all the way into the 20th century where we see the civil rights movement also using free speech and a free press to destroy Jim Crow. And again, in the end, realize the Declaration of Independence's promise of freedom and equality. Fantastic. Now, what we're going to do in class today is we're going to break down the First Amendment, kind of examine the text of the First Amendment. We always start with the Constitution. Um, we're going to have a T-shirt that says that soon. Colin will send you one. Um, and then we're going to dive through kind of American history, because as I joked when we started, it, this is definitely a zigzag of rights. So I think I love this conversation because it has so many twists and turns. Um, so Tom, kind of break us down. There's a lot in that First Amendment. Unpack that First Amendment for us and help us understand all the freedoms in the First Amendment and then why they're together too. Yeah, so the First Amendment, one way to think about it is it's its own bundle of rights. And so in the end, we talk about the First Amendment protecting five freedoms. There's religion, speech, press, assembly, petition. And the big idea that really unites all of these freedoms is really the idea of the freedom of conscience. This is our freedom to believe what we'd like without the government interfering. We see it obviously when it comes to the freedom of religion, to believe in God or not believe in God, that being protected as a natural right. But then we see with speech, press, assembly, and petition, a bunch of different ways in which we can then communicate our ideas to one another and to the world. And so again, if the First Amendment it's giving us the freedom to believe and think what we'd like, giving us that freedom, that space to do so, and then all of these other mechanisms to share those ideas with the world. Fantastic. Okay, great way to unpack it. I already have 8 million questions in my head as we go through this for you. Um, but let's start by looking at the exact words of the First Amendment. And then I know today we're really just going to narrow in to that first section, that first clause of the Constitution. Yeah, so I mean, the key part that we're talking about today is Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. So that part that's underlined there. And just as we look at the text of the amendment, it's worth flagging a few things up front. So one, the text says Congress. But what we should understand is the First Amendment, it protects more than against actions taken by Congress. It protects us from abuses done by all the parts of the national government. And following the 14th Amendment and later Supreme Court decisions in a process known as incorporation, it has also applied the First Amendment to abuses by state and local governments. So the First Amendment is a broad promise of freedom against actions taken by the national government, the state government, and local governments. So that's the First Amendment in, in, in sort of a big sense. 
Perfect. And I guess it would really be the third clause. Would it be considered the third clause because there's the two religion clauses and then the uh, freedom of people would disagree. Clause? I, I I try not to. Yeah, it, <laughs> okay. I'm just trying to get my order in a row. I'm like, wait a minute, that's not first. <laughs> um, okay, so let's start with looking at, and we'll go as we go through these stories. We'll really talk about what the First Amendment covers, what it covered in different periods of time as well. So really, what it says what it covers, and then also how we walk through history. So I think that, you know, we've got the First Amendment at it very quickly after the Constitution is signed. The Constitution is signed in 1787, it's ratified, um, and then the First Amendment is quickly at it. And then we have a pretty soon after that, we have a test of it. So can you talk a little bit about that first moment in time for the test of the First Amendment and the Alien and Sedition Acts? 1798. John Adams is president. Thomas Jefferson's is vice president. We have James Madison involved as well. So it's a lot. It's a, quite a cast of characters, a bunch of different founding fathers. Another thing to note is that we're already seeing in the 1790s the rise of political parties. And so John Adams is part of one party known as the Federalist. Thomas Jefferson is the leader of the opposition party, even though he's vice president. So imagine that we have a president and vice president of different parties. It would be like Joe Biden is president, Donald Trump is vice president. You can imagine the friction between the two sides. The other thing to note is during this period, there are big political issues that Americans are already debating. The big one on the world stage is we see a conflict breaking out between Great Britain and France. And Americans divide over whether America should stand with the British or stand with the French. John Adams and his allies tend to side with the British Thomas Jefferson and his allies tend to side with the French. And so we have all sorts of nasty political speech happening and speech attacking John Adams and the national government. And so John Adams and his allies in Congress end up passing something known as the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. What's relevant to us here is that the Sedition Act of 1798 in particular punished people for speech criticizing the national government or President John Adams. So we think of this today, we think what could more clearly violate the freedom of speech, the First Amendment, than, than an act that is saying we can't criticize the national government. But we can see here already this early, there are big debates over how broadly the First Amendment sweeps. And Adam says, yes, we can actually, absolutely, the national government can protect its own reputation by passing a law like the Sedition Act of 1798. Of course, the law itself only, only criminalized conduct that criticized the president, John Adams, it didn't apply to criticisms of his vice president, Thomas Jefferson. You see, there's already something a little fishy about the Sedition Act. Um, but in the end, we see Thomas Jefferson, the vice president, and his ally, James Madison, the father of the Constitution, step in to criticize the Sedition Act. They author in secret these two documents known as the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. These are writings that are passed by the legislatures of Virginia and Kentucky, but they make big constitutional arguments explaining why the Sedition Act is unconstitutional. In a really powerful passage, Madison in the Virginia Resolutions argues that this exercise of, quote, power ought to pr produce universal alarm because it is leveled against the right of freely examining public characters and measures and a free communication among the people thereon, which has ever been justly deemed the only effectual guardian of every other right. So what Madison's saying here is we have a First Amendment for a reason. The reason is that we, the people, have, the power, have to have the power to criticize our government. That's the only way our government's going to work if we have the power to call our government out when it's doing something unwise or abusive, or it's going after our rights. We have to have the right to free speech and a free press to hold the government accountable. Fantastic, and I, this one always makes me laugh because it's, it feels like it doesn't follow the rule of law at all. This applies to, to me, not you. Um, so there's, how did, did Adams ever like explain why that he thought, because it feels like Adams would like at least try to explain himself out of that one looking so unequal and unfair. Well, I don't know. The, the, I mean, the, the big idea, so John Adams in defending the law would say that, you know, th there's, there's a deep belief that republics, so something like America, like our democracy is fragile. That's what history taught the founders. So the idea is the national government has to have the power to protect itself from people attacking its reputation because of the reputation of the national government crumbles, the entire government's going to fall. So there's a sense of the Republic as fragile that's really animating the Sedition Acts. But I don't know if they ever really explained why it should apply to John Adams and not Thomas Jefferson. That seems, again, just a little fishy. 
Um, okay, a couple of questions about this time period before we jump um, to the next kind of big time period. One, um, Helen asked about the Enlightenment thinkers. So who, and the, our students at the 12 o'clock class asked this too, when writing the First Amendment, who were they calling upon? So uh, Madison, who was he reading to really influence how they were gonna write the First Amendment? and where the ideas came from, or was it just a unique new thing for any government to have? No, I mean, there are a few things in mind. There are big thinkers. So, I mean, they definitely would have been, at Madison's drawing on John Locke's letters on, 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 on religious toleration, which talk about religious tolerance, but also the importance of the free spread of ideas. Jer M Madison's also drawing on state constitutions, which have all sorts of language in them, protecting the freedom of the press and talking about how that's so important to the survival of a republic. They're thinking about big early cases like the trial of John Peter Zenger in colonial New York, where Zenger, the royal governor of New York, tries to shut down the printer, Zenger from criticizing the governor, and then the jury steps in and protects the free press rights of John Peter Zenger. So they're thinking about things like that. Um, and broadly, also Madison is drawing on some of the ideas of his own friend, Thomas Jefferson who in his famous Bill on Religious Liberty in Virginia, again, speaks about how important the free exchange of ideas are to the health of the Republic. So there's a lot of different ideas. The First Amendment is nothing, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not meant to be something new and novel. It's meant to really embody a lot of the important ideas, a lot of the lessons of history and political theory. Oh, and that was great. That reference to um, Jefferson's letter that's in our new curriculum. So if anybody wants to really dig deep in that, it's all over. There's a video on it and other materials. One other question on this topic. So uh, Don, and I really like this question, Don, because it's such a good good one. Okay, he gets the Virginia, but why Kentucky? How, what, why is it Virginia and Kentucky resolution? I think it's just the two places where they had allies they could work with, because what happens is they go to Virginia and Kentucky, Kentucky and Virginia pass these resolutions. Jefferson and Madison are hoping they're going to spread like wildfire and other state legislators are going to hop in, but no one else was interested in passing <laughs> resolutions. So there was a base of Democratic Republican support in both of those states. The last Dakota on this, it's so cool, I think, about this episode, is in the end, the constitutionality of the Sedition Act, it's not decided by the Supreme Court like we would have it today. Instead, in many ways, it's decided by the election of 1800 and by the American people who elect Thomas Jefferson, who allows the Sedition Act to expire, and then pardons the people who were thrown in jail under the Sedition Act. Fantastic, that's a great question, Don, I love it. Um, I feel like we talked about this like years ago and I'm like, I don't remember the answer. Um, okay, so let's jump to like another time period, another group of people that were using free speech to ensure that we all have rights. So this brings us to the abolitionist movement. So. I love this scene, kind of unpack the scene for us, tell us what's going on here, and also really define for us, who are abolitionists? I read uh, Sean Wallace's book uh, not too long ago, um, No Property in Man, and he really spends like the first chapter setting up, what are we really talking about when we're talking about an abolitionist and what kind of power and courage it took to be an abolitionist at this time? So tell us more about um, free speech and the abolitionist movement. Yeah, so when we're talking about the abolitionist movement here, um, we're talking about people who are fighting for the end, the immediate end of slavery. Um, and when we're talking about this story, we're particularly focusing on from really the 1820s up into the outbreak of the Civil War in 1860. And you know, for us in the 21st century, it's easy to look back at this history and say, clearly the abolitionists are the hero of the story. Of course, they're right. Of course, they're on the side of good and the other side is on the side of evil. But what's important to understand is in the 1820s and 1830s, especially, and even earlier than that, the abolitionists are looked at as troublemakers. They're seen as rabble risers. Their speech is seen as among the most dangerous speech in America. So we see states throughout the nation pass laws, especially in the South, outlawing abolitionist speech, preaching, meetings. So we see laws on the book saying these things are illegal. But importantly, we also see these ideas, these, uh, these ideas of suppressing abolitionist speech enforced by violence. So we have violent mobs shutting down abolitionist speech. In many ways, the most famous example of this is probably the, the death of Illinois printer Elijah Lovejoy in 1837. Where does that mob rise up? He's a, an abolitionist printer. The mob is not in the South. The abolitionist mob for Elijah Lovejoy, it's in Illinois. It's in the land of Lincoln. And so we see violence against abolitionists in the South, in the West, even all the way up into the Northeast, though, in places like New York City and Philadelphia. And finally, what we see with the example we're going to talk about here is even Boston, 
Even in Boston, Massachusetts, the, the cradle in many ways of a lot of really egalitarian thinking, we see mob violence there. And so the famous episode we're gonna talk about now, it's December 3rd, 1860. It's the one year anniversary of John Brown's death. Abraham Lincoln a month earlier is just elected as the first anti-slavery president of the United States. And Frederick Douglass and his abolitionist allies go to Boston, Massachusetts to the Tremont uh, uh, Temple, uh, Temple Baptist Church in Boston. And they just wanna hold an abolitionist meeting. They just wanna hold a meeting of abolitionist speakers organized around the, the, the question of how can slavery be abolished? So it's a big question, but it's a peaceful gathering of abolitionists. And what happens? It's broken up by a violent mob. A violent mob effectively says through violence that abolitionists are not welcome to meet even here in Boston. And so the, the, the meeting disperses six days later, uh, Frederick Douglass is scheduled to give a, a speech in Boston. And so it's at Boston's Music Hall, and he uses these remarks to really talk about the importance of free speech more broadly. It's known as his plea for free speech in Boston. It's 1860. And Frederick Douglass says a couple of really big things here. You know, one is he notes the location. He says, you know, right here, we're having, we have the, we're going to have this abolitionist meeting in Boston which he said, nowhere more than Boston have the principles of human freedom been expounded. So here we're thinking about, this is the birthplace of the American Revolution. We, we see you know, many people who attacked many of the strongest voices against slavery are right here in Boston. Some of the most, the, the biggest supporters of equality for African-Americans are right here in Boston. But even here, the quote, moral atmosphere was dark and heavy. So, so Douglas is saying that even in a place like Boston, sometimes abolitionist speech can be shut down by mobs. And why is this a big deal? Well, Frederick Douglass explains to us why the free speech and a free press are so important. He says, one, they were among the most important rights to the founders themselves. The founders thought that they were absolutely essential to the success of the American Republic. But importantly, for abolitionists, free speech is so important because it's going to be through free speech that we can change people's minds and change our country and get rid of slavery. So what Douglass says here is that, quote, slavery cannot tolerate free speech Five years of its exercise would banish the auction block and break every chain in the South. So free speech leads to change. Free speech for who? Frederick Lincoln says free speech for everybody, for the rich and the poor, for the educated, the less well-educated, the white, the African-American, all of us have to have the freedom of speech. Why? In part, it's the idea that we as speakers, it's important for us to be able to speak our mind for our own dignity, for us to be good citizens. It's important to the, to the country at large because it can promote big change. But finally, it's also important to the audience, to the listeners, not just the speaker, but to the listeners. Because what's important for broadly for political debate and constitutional debate is that everyone is free to speak their mind. And then the audience can hear all of those ideas unimpeded. And by listening to those ideas, can make up their own minds about the right path. And Frederick Douglass had a deep faith that if you had that freedom of speech, slavery would die and freedom would flourish. It's unbelievably powerful. And we'll make sure we send out this document so everybody can read it. Uh, Tom, is it in the Founders Library? Just it is, sure? yes. Great, that's what I thought. So we'll make sure we connect you to the Founders Library so you can unpack and read all the words. There's so many slides in here in, as well that was sent out this morning in the links but it's really powerful about this power of speech, not just what you share, but the power of speech as a listener, as a person in the audience to get new ideas, to get to hear different perspectives on arguments. And that means when we protect all speech, we're able to have these conversations. Because as Tom pointed out, this was considered the bad speech at the time. And so how do we understand the power of free speech and what does that mean to actually protect speech? And now here we go. So I guess this was a bit of a zig and now we're gonna do a zag um, and talk about free speech and how the government protected it or did not protect it during World War II, World War I and World War II. Absolutely. So, I mean, if we think about free speech in America and we think about free speech today, we would say that free speech protections in America today are the strongest they've ever been in our history. And America protects free speech more broadly than any other country in the nation. Here in America, the rule is, generally speaking, the government can't punish your speech unless your speech is likely to and intended to incite immediate lawless action. So it's a really strongly pro-speech protective rule. But as we already saw from the Alien and Sedition X controversy, we haven't always followed it. 
And then fast forwarding into the World War I era, so the early 20th century, we could see deja vu. We once again don't follow it. So once again, right here in World War I, it's the outbreak of World War I, Woodrow Wilson's president. And there are a lot of anti-war protesters. A lot of people speaking out against the war, didn't think the war was a good idea. Woodrow Wilson and Congress respond, much like the Adams administration, by passing new laws, the Espionage Act and their own Sedition Act, which effectively... Yes, I'm sorry. Sorry, Tom, just to add in, because this was a question earlier. Why do they tend to go together, those two acts? Are they always alien and sedition? And like, how are they connected? Well, they were just passed at, at the same moment in time. So they, they deal with different things. The alien, part of the Alien and Sedition Acts deals with making it easier for the government to basically deport foreign nationals. Um, and in World War I, these restrictions, the Espionage Act goes specifically to efforts at espionage, but also efforts to undermine specifically the war effort. So for instance, if you're trying to undermine the draft, that's the Espionage Act. The, the Congress then stepped in with the Sedition Act, which was an add-on, which, which wound up covering even more speech critical of the government. So it made the, mm. the Espionage Act, took that baseline and made it even broader. So attacking even more of the anti-war speech. And so effectively what we see is the Wilson administration following the Adams administration's playbook, and they end up prosecuting a bunch of people. Thousands of people, the Wilson administration goes after them for their anti-war activities. One of the most famous examples is right here, Eugene Victor Debs. So Eugene Debs, he's the leading socialist in the country. He's like the Bernie Sanders of his own time. He's a great political activist. He ran for president multiple times before this. And what he's, what, what's at issue here is he delivers an anti-war speech in June of 1918. And he's prosecuted he's, and he's convicted under the Sedition Act. And so again, we think all Debs is doing here is criticizing the war. What could be more core First Amendment speech than that? But Congress passed this law and the Supreme Court said the Sedition Act, it's constitutional. That in the end, the Congress has the power to pass the Sedition Act and strike out against anti-war speech. The Supreme Court upholds the, the, uh, Debs' conviction unanimously in an opinion written by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. So according to the Supreme Court, Debs uh, can't speak his conscience when it comes to the war. Now, this is not the only example here during this area of the Supreme Court upholding the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act. Another famous example is Schenck versus United States in 1919. And here the defendants are charged with mailing printed circulars designed to obstruct the military draft in violation of the Espionage Act of 1917. So they're convicted. The case ends up before the Supreme Court. And once again, the Supreme Court sides with the government, says the government has the power to pass something like the Espionage Act. And Schenck has the famous language from Olive Wendell Holmes emphasizing that the First Amendment is not absolute. One, the Congress can pass laws that go at a clear and present danger to, uh, to the United States. But two, the famous quote is a, a, a he, Holmes writes that uh, uh, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. So, human, so what Holmes is teaching us here is that the First Amendment is not absolute. And so with Schenck and Debs, you see the Supreme Court siding with the government, siding with the repression of speech and against core free speech values that we look at today. But shortly thereafter, Curry, what we see is a big sea change at least among two important justices on the Supreme Court, Oliver Wendell Holmes himself, who was the author of both Debs and Schenck, but also Justice Louis Brandeis. And so what they do in cases after this, cases like Abrams, cases like Whitney, is they write separate opinions. They're in the minority. The Supreme Court's not agreeing with them, but they're laying out some of the big ideas about why we need broad free speech protections, effectively saying why the Supreme Court has been wrong and why we need a stronger First Amendment protection of free speech and a free press. Oliver Wendell Holmes teaches us in a case called Schwimmer that part of it is that we need to protect the freedom for the thought that we hate. So it's, we don't need popular speech to be protected. We need to protect the speech that we hate in our core. Why? Because we can't trust the government to tell us what's good speech and what's bad speech. That's what we learned from the abolitionists. We can't, we can't have the national, we can't have the government, we can't trust them to tell us what's good, what's bad, what's true, what's false. Instead, we need freedom. And so this connects to Oliver Wendell Holmes also had a famous theory known as, known as his marketplace of ideas theory. He said the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. He said that in dissent in a case called Abrams versus the United States. The idea, again, being we don't want the government to step in and say, no, this idea isn't allowed. We want a free play of ideas. We want all the ideas, in the, all the important ideas to be out there and allow us, all of us to reason together, converse, and we'll get closer to truth. 
And then finally, with Justice Brandeis and Whitney, we have a powerful vision where he basically argues American democracy requires free, liberty-loving citizens committed to deliberation, Republican citizenship, and the public good. And here's the key language from Whitney. If there be time to expose through discussion the falsehood and fallacies to avert the evil by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. So if someone says something you don't like, don't go to the government and ask the government to punish it. You come out and you speak your mind and say why that other speech is false. Unify with your, with your fellow Americans, form groups, and try to advance your vision of the truth. That's what we want. We want a free play of ideas in America. That's the core of the First Amendment. And, and I love this because as you go through these cases and you look at what's going on in that time period with, you know, Schenck in 1919 and then moving through and you, you just follow Holmes alone, you see this kind of evolution of ideas moving through the opinions and dissents and how it kind of manifests in the Whitney decision um, and towards the end. But I do find it kind of interesting how they come at this as very differently, where Holmes talks about like a competition of ideas and, and Brandeis talks about, you know, the more the better, the more in the ideas that come in, the, the good can outweigh. But at the end of the day, they're both saying, it's not the government's job to say what speech is good or bad, it's we the people's job to do action to affect good or bad speech. Um, as we kind of go through this and look at it, we start to say, okay, but it depends. It all depends where. It can depend, where can change so much of these conversations. So we're talking about a marketplace of ideas, almost literally in the market of our big cities or our, you know, our towns and our communities. But how does that change during this time period and even into the 40s when you talk about schools and the role of schools, public schools in our society and the, the responsibility to ensure that all of our students have free speech rights as well? Yeah, I mean, it's a long road before the Supreme Court actually comes to agree with Holmes and Brandeis. I mean, it's really not until the late 60s where we get the strong free speech protections we know today in a case called Brandenburg. But we see some movements in that direction earlier. One key example is West Virginia versus Barnett. Here, West Virginia sets a, sets a rule saying that students in their public school classrooms during World War II, they have to salute the flag. And so in, in Barnett, we have two children, an eight-year-old and an 11-year-old, they're Jehovah's Witnesses. They, they say, you know, based on our religion, we can't salute the flag. It's against our religious beliefs, so we refuse to do that. These are courageous, again, eight-year-olds and 11-year-olds. These are really courageous kids. In the end, the school punishes them. Their case ends up before the Supreme Court, a case known as West Virginia versus Barnett. It's 1943. And the Supreme Court sides with free speech. They side with the students. In the end, what the court says in very famous language is... Um, that if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation is that no official high or petty can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or faith therein. So it's protecting a certain scope of belief and conscience. Um, and, and again, it's, it's an early example of the Supreme Court finally beginning to read the First Amendment protections you know, in, in a broader way. And now we only have a couple more minutes left, but I kind of want to jump to schools and to the, some of the questions in the chat as well are around social media and schools. And I think that really perfectly brings us to a very modern court case on social media and schools today because social media is not contained to only to be in the school or only to be written in the school or read in the school. And we have this dissolving of the school walls because of you know, social media overall. So how does the court rule on this? Absolutely. So, I mean, again, the, the First Amendment says no law, but what we know is that First Amendment protections aren't absolute. There are limits on the scope of free speech and free press. So we have the broad rule from Brandenburg giving broad free speech rights, but there are certain areas where the government has more power to regulate speech. Some of this are things like time, place, and manner regulations. Like for instance, they can't be someone outside my home with a megaphone saying whatever they want to at two o'clock in the morning. Doesn't matter what they're saying, they just can't do it. The government has a strong interest to have noise, noise regulations to make sure that we can all sleep. There are also those certain areas in which the government has greater authority to regulate speech. Prisons are one example. They can regulate speech in order to make sure there's order in prisons. You can regulate speech inside courts. 
So for instance, you could have perjury laws to keep people from lying. You could have law, laws in place to make sure people are quiet during court proceedings. But also there are special rules that apply to public schools. And so what the court has said over time, they've said a couple different things. So one from Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District, the famous case in 1969, the court's very clear that students don't shed their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse gate. And so students there wore black armbands to protest the Vietnam War. There's Mary Beth Tinker and John Tinker in their school. There's no disruption inside the school. The school punishes them, tells them they have to take off their armbands. The, the, the Supreme Court ultimately sides with the Tinkers. And it says, look, they, have, they can wear these armbands. In the end, the, the, the government has an interest in stepping in if activity is going to materially or substantially interfere with the school's operations or a legitimate mission of the school. But that's not an issue here. So from Tinker, we get the idea, yeah, the First Amendment is going to apply inside the schools. We have later cases uh, uh, like, uh, 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 you know, like uh, uh, Morse v. Frederick um, and, and Kulmer, two cases where we also say, you know, there are certain instances in which the school has more authority to punish certain speech. In one case, you know, it can prevent a school newspaper from printing articles that were seen as inappropriate subjects for a school newspaper like teenage pregnancy and Morse v. Frederick. Um, the student there was reading wore that <laughs> had that sign up bong hits for Jesus um, at, 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 a, at a you know outside of his school that was seen as you can regulate that speech because it may be promoting drug use. So there there's sort of like this combination of schools on the one hand the First Amendment applies but on the other hand the First Amendment applies differently because the government can step in in certain in certain cases to regulate speech inside schools in a way that it couldn't more broadly in society and it, the regulations are tied to the school's mission of educating tomorrow's citizens which brings us now finally to this Mahanoy case which this involves a, a cheerleader in a high school who is disappointed because the tryout didn't go the way she wanted it to she goes to social media off of school's campus and you know says some nasty things about the, the you know the people that um, didn't didn't that you know that 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 were uh, in charge of the tryout. In the end, um, she's punished for this speech that she does on social media. The, the and the big question in Mahanoy is, you know, on the one hand, this speech is happening on social media. Let's let's say that it's entirely happening outside of school. That it's not you know that it's just happening outside of the school. In the end, though, that speech can still affect materially affect what's happening inside the school. And so the question is, to what degree, you know, the First Amendment applies to this sort of activity. In the end, what the Supreme Court says in Mahanoy is it, it ends up siding with the cheerleader in that case and her interest in broad free speech rights. In part, it's an opinion by uh, Justice Stephen Breyer. And in part, what Breyer says is, look, part of what we're teaching inside the schools is how to function inside a democracy. Part of the way in which a democracy works is we have to have the freedom to speak and sometimes speak in not the kindest of ways. Sometimes that's the way in which we can make change happen. And so in the end, we're not deciding every question when it comes to social media in schools. And the court's very clear about that. It's gonna to have to take more cases to sort of draw cleaner lines. But in this case, it's, it's at least laying out that there is an important First Amendment interest for a student in this context to be giving critical speech pertaining to a cheerleading tryout on social media. Fantastic, Tom. Thank you so much for speed walking us through all those big cases. And there's so many more that we could talk about as well. Um, I think one of the questions that we had in here that we can wrap up with was when we talk about free speech on social media. So where, you know, social media is not owned by the government, but there are some regulations around it. So the questions were really on where does free speech fall in the realm of, of social media? And then also how a president uses social media, how can that be um, regulated by the government? So unpack those two big ideas and then we'll wrap up for the day, but this is a fun one. Yeah, so I mean, so generally speaking, the First Amendment, it applies to the government. It doesn't apply, apply to private businesses. So I mean, that's sort of the big, that's the big idea, the big thing to know. Um, but there are a bunch of different questions that follow from that. One is that for social media platforms, even if the First Amendment itself doesn't formally apply in certain contexts, you know, to what degree should traditional free speech First Amendment values for inform how they regulate the speech on the platforms themselves? So even if it's not technically a constitutional issue as in you're going to go to court and decide this, to what degree should the deciders at these companies be drawing on the best lessons from the First Amendment tradition? Um, our own boss, Jeff Rosen, had a great article about this in The Atlantic a couple of years ago, forcing us to wrestle with how much speech on the platforms should be 
similar, it's treated similarly to how the Supreme Court treats free speech more broadly or not. So there's that sort of a question. The Supreme Court's actually going to hear two important cases dealing with uh, speech on the platforms this upcoming term. And so both of those have to do with what sort of immunity social media platforms get from a law passed by Congress. It's known as the Communications Decency Act. Um, but in effect, what the, so that in the end, uh, it's, it's two people who were uh, tragically killed in terrorist attacks. And they're saying that in the end, that the platforms, what they did is by magnifying the speech of extremist organizations, they actually spurred the violence and should therefore be held accountable for the violence that happened in that context. And so the question is, you know, the platform said, no, 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 this is, you know, core free speech issue. We have free speech protections here. And so, you know, in the end, we need to read this, this immunity quite broadly to protect our, you know, right to have a big forum for the communication of ideas. And so there's going to be a couple of cases there where the court is going to clarify how much social media platforms can be held responsible for speech that it amplifies um, versus how much authority Congress has to regulate that and sort of a series of questions along those lines. There's also another case coming through um, uh, that the courts may take for next term where there were laws passed by Texas and Florida that outlawed the ability of social media platforms to effectively um, censor certain speech, the accusation being that the platforms tend to censor conservative speech. And so it's a state laws that are passed to regulate what sort of what sort of uh, regulation the platform could have of the own, their own speech on the platform within those states. And so the courts have actually, and the lower courts have come out differently on this issue, whether states have the power to regulate the platforms in that context. And there's a pretty good chance the court's gonna take that next term as well. So again, like it's, it's to say that in some broad sense, the, the big picture point is again, the first amendment applies to the national government. It doesn't apply to the platforms, but there are all sorts of interesting and fast moving first amendment issues that are at the intersection of, you know, the speech that's happening on the platforms, the First Amendment, formally, and then the First, First Amendment in terms of much broader and deeper values. And what was the name of that? That second case really intrigues me because then I think about, because if you correlate free speech amplification with violence, you could also be shutting down and again, it doesn't apply outside of our country, but you could be shutting down revolutions like we see with the the women's fights for equality in countries like Iran. Like, do you, like that goes both ways. Um, and I it just, what was the name of the second case? I guess and now I need to unpack that one more. We can, we can send it out to people. I don't okay, remember it off the top of my head. Okay, good. We'll send it out to everybody and then we'll all unpack it. I just, the, the power and the negativity of social media is something that we constantly talk about and we should have in these conversations in these classes, in our own classes at our, you know, our kitchen table. But the, seeing the the pro and con of each side of that too, because you can make great social change because of the power of these amplifications as well. Yeah, and that's why I mean the court has not taken a lot of social media related cases through the years, but where you saw with Mahanoy and now these cases this term and the one potentially next term that the court's going to begin to redefine some of the law in that area. So it's going to be interesting. It's a it's an area also that doesn't necessarily cut clearly based on ideology. And so it'll be one where the, yeah. where the, it'll be interesting to see where the justices come down. Great, awesome. Thanks, Tom. That was a nice little Supreme Court uh, preview too. So I appreciate it. Um, thank you, everybody. I hope you guys have a great day today. If you need anything, just email us and I will make sure that we do the wrap up at the end of the week with all of these cases and the cases that were shared in the chat that we weren't able to get to today because there's about a million that we could talk about and we love them. So great sharing the Kennedy case. It's something we can share as well as a few others. And we'll also share the Founders Library because a lot of these cases and a lot of these stories and speeches are in the Founders Library. So it's a wonderful treasure trove of awesome things to check out. Yeah, there's a ton more of First Amendment stuff in there too, both speeches and cases. <clears throat> yeah, so many things. Cool. Thanks, Tom. All right. Thanks, everyone.